Suppose you're grocery shopping and you see a product that says it's good for the planet. Are you more likely to buy it? If your answer was yes, you're not alone. This is one of the findings of a new joint study by McKinsey and Nielsen IQ about consumer behavior and spending in the U.S. Today, we're sharing an episode from the McKinsey on Consumer and Retail podcast that talks all about this new research. The McKinsey podcast is back in two weeks. Until then, check out some of our recent episodes and be well. So let's meet our three guests today. Vineet Doshi is a senior expert based in McKinsey's Stamford, Connecticut office. Vineet has 25 years of experience in advanced analytics, focusing primarily on growth strategy in CPG and retail. Good to have you here, Vineet. Thank you so much, Monica. Really thrilled to be here. Sherry Fry describes herself as a, quote, passionate wellness thought leader. She is vice president of total wellness at Nielsen IQ. And Sherry, a little later, you'll have to tell us exactly what that title means. But for now, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Monica. Great to be here with you all. And Steve Noble is a senior partner based in McKinsey's Minneapolis office. He co-leads McKinsey's work in retail transformation globally. Steve was on this podcast about two and a half years ago during COVID. And when asked about how his shopping habits had changed, Steve, you said, I don't buy pants anymore. I just buy a lot of (laughs) wine (laughs) or something like that. (laughs) Anyway, welcome back to the podcast, Steve. Thank you, Monica. Good to be here. And I I think perhaps my personal habits were reflected by others uh, in that period of time as, as well as it turns out. Perhaps. Anyway, before we get into the report, Sherry, maybe you can briefly explain to us what it means to be VP of Total Wellness at Nielsen IQ. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, we call it total wellness here at NIQ because we've really found that the consumer is merging how they're thinking about not just their personal health and wellness, but the health of the planet and the and really this idea of social responsibility or the health of others. And so we've really found that um, the pandemic was one of those things that had accelerated this kind of convergence of these, these three elements. Um, and that's why we call it total wellness, because we really find that it is, it's important to look at this holistic view the way the consumer is. That's actually a great segue into the report, which we're going to talk about now. So again, it was a huge study, right? Five years of sales data from 2017 to mid-2022, covering 600,000 SKUs in 32 CPG categories. And I encourage our listeners to look it up on McKinsey.com. The title of the article is Consumers care about sustainability and back it up with their wallets. And there are so many interesting and and detailed insights in your report. But I first want to ask each of you, what finding or findings surprised you most? One of the things that surprised me the most is that that there's such an effect across um, all the categories, right? So many of the categories, whether they show outsized growth at a total level or not, right? Oftentimes beneath the surface, there are brands and segments of products, um, including private label products that show uh, a surprisingly positive uh, growth rate for products with claims, right? Um, And and so there's instances of success across the board, right? So that's, that's one thing that surprised me because we often see that there's a gap between people's uh, sentiment and stated intent versus their actual behavior. So to see it uh, translate into actual sales was uh, gratifying. I think we went into the research with the hypothesis that um, it would be challenger brands, smaller brands that would be driving a lot of the growth that would be really driving the sustainability. And I I was surprised to see private label, actually. I think I was pleasantly surprised to see that private label really was driving some of the outsized growth. And frankly, that we saw the opportunity across almost all the segments, except for really maybe that biggest opportunity in the medium sized segment of of brands. But I hadn't really been thinking about uh, private label playing such a role. And I think, you know, Monica, you mentioned what a massive undertaking this was. I mean, this was five years of data. And it was also not just the first time we were where we looked across hundreds of claims, but We looked across all brands, all sizes, and the fact that we looked at private label as well, I think is a really important aspect of kind of what the future of this this is going to look like for the entire CPG space. As we released the report, uh, I was was surprised um, and pleasantly surprised of the breadth of the reaction we got, right? It wasn't just U.S. CPG companies that were interested in this. It was a broad set of U.S. stakeholders, yes, CPG companies. Also retailers, you know, also you know, players that are involved in the sustainability space more broadly. Uh, I think we've had conversations with executives on five continents at this point, right? So it's a very, very 
um, I think I think pertinent, but but topic that uh, there's a there's a thirst for quite broadly. And that was actually going to be my my next question, like about business leaders at uh, at companies that have read the report, because I imagine the data isn't just interesting, but actually valuable to them, especially given the, the specificity of the insights, right? Because you looked at which types of ESG claims are correlated with higher sales in specific categories. Say a little bit more about that, Steve and, and Sherry and Vineet. Which aspects of the report are resonating with uh, business leaders the most? What are you hearing from them? And what other kinds of questions are they asking you? The report, as as you will know, is, is across category. What's really interesting is when you dive into individual categories, right? And you start peeling back the onion to understand within a specific category what happens, within the specific brands in that category what happens. And so that's where a lot of our conversations have been is not a overall spending, but in my category in salty snacks, uh, you know, or, or or in in carbonated beverage as examples, right? What's actually going on? Um, and so to me, that's that's been a, a place the conversations have have gone that's been quite interesting. As clients are looking at this research, I mean, there's been a lot of gratitude, you know, of just thanks, right? Like we we all see all of this research that's out there that consumers say, but what do they really do? So to have actual fact based business information that that really illustrates. Um, that there is a business case, you know, I think that the second question that we're always getting is, can we charge a price premium, right? Like what is the price premium opportunities? How do we think about this, you know, from an investment perspective, there is a differentiation opportunity, but also there's collaboration opportunities. And I think that's been um, also a really fun part of the, the client conversations in terms of how do we really think about, you know, collaborating differently across the entire supply chain and even with our competitors. Where the product teams and merchandising teams and category managers really uh, engage even deeper is when it gets down to the level of specific claims. So within environmental sustainability, is it the generic claim? Is it the forest stewardship council claim? Is it the you know sustainable packaging claim? What are the, the specific things that work in their category and uh, what works more often? So that's where the granularity is, has been pretty, particularly powerful. Vinita, I think it's been interesting too to add on to that. You know how we found in the research there are certain claims in certain categories that absolutely can be a differentiator, but they might be table stakes in another category. And so understanding what's happening with those claims in other categories that can kind of be that lens to what the future might look like. When you release a report like this, it's always interesting is to say what sort of critical questions you get. What do you get for the those that are trying to sort of poke holes in in uh, or challenge maybe the the research? One of the questions I found interesting is, hey, this is great research, but the past five years have been you know pretty unique, a very strong economy, and then we had you know COVID years and some recovery from that. Um, how does this play out in a recession, right? We know they're premium price products in many cases. So what happens when there's there's a recession? Um, and of course, you know, the data doesn't cover a recessionary period, but a couple of interesting anecdotes that that I that I think have, have been interesting for me. We had a, a discussion um, and, and there was a panelist uh, in that discussion who had spent um, the global financial crisis leading grocery for one of the, the specialty grocery players and was saying at that point in time, different set of attributes, but they'd actually tracked a series of sustainability attributes on a set of products. And those product cohorts continued to grow quarter over quarter over quarter through the great financial crisis uh, and, and that recessionary period where the overall business struggled, right? Um, you mentioned the point earlier, right? Private label does quite well. Traditionally, private label actually accelerates during a recession, right? And then tends to hold on to that share. Uh, so interesting if you think about what happens if, if the economy enters a recession coming uh, coming up, right? You could imagine that private label and the strength of these claims in private label uh, will, will also be strong. So our hypothesis, at least, would be that what we saw in terms of outperformance in a, a reasonably strong economy likely holds up in, in, a, in a recessionary environment. We're actually kind of even finding that from when we closed the, the study and, you know, re, we ran all of the data. Um, we've been tracking a core set of attributes, you know, uh, around wellness, all things wellness, right? So things like organic, thing, you know, things that we, we see that consumers are doing. And we actually have been surprised because we've seen some trading, things like organic. There's been some trading down, some penetration down, um, but we haven't seen that in the sustainability attributes as a whole. Inflationary impacts aren't impacting sustainability the way that we thought. And, and frankly, we actually hypothesized that we would see some trading down and some trading out, and we just have not seen it the way we're seeing in some of the other kind of wellness-related uh, characteristics. 
to what do you guys attribute this sustained interest or spending, the sustained spending in sustainability? Sherry, like you said, it hasn't dropped off. Is that just, you know, consumers' mindsets are now permanently changed and they are thinking about climate change and all of that? Or is there something else going on? Consumers are just being exposed to so many more claims on package than ever before. Even things like carbon or water footprint, as you start to see that, you know, not just on a certain set of categories, but being carried across more and more categories in the store. And if it's, if, you know, I see it on my food and I see it on my beauty products, I'm really start to get an awareness. We do know that there's a subset of consumers that are apathetic. You know, we find it's about one, 5% of consumers are like, I don't, I don't, I don't care. I'm not doing anything. I don't, you know, it's too overwhelming to do anything, but 95% of the rest of consumers are on a spectrum from highly passionate, you know, really educated to, um, you know, the people that are, you know, just trying to do better day in and day out. And that is um, across all demographics. I think also the central place of what's going on in the in the news around climate change, the IPCC recently re- released a report highlighting the urgency. It has a, an effect on the, the total consumer mindset, right? And, and, and Gen Z, we know, is one of the generations that cares more. And as they become more important to the consumer market, it's uh, it, it, it's really resonating. Yeah. Vinny, we actually, we did, just did some research in the in November timeframe. And Consumers did say, like, you know, when we asked, like, why, why do you care more? Why is it more important to you? You're right. It was media. You know, that was one of the top ones. But the second thing that they said, you know, that um, one of the top three was I'm being affected. You know, I'm actually personally being affected by weather impact and climate impact. And in fact, we, you know, we saw 61 percent of consumers that said, I actually think the environment is having an adverse effect on my personal health. So they really are starting to tie this all, all more and more together. When we looked at the, you know, the, the question of, is this disproportionately driven by one demographic group or set of groups versus, versus others? Uh, and the answer was generally no, right? We found pretty strong adoption across age and income brackets, right? That said, right, Gen Z does skew a little bit higher than the others. And so you can imagine as that cohort both uh, is relatively more passionate about this, and also their spending power increases. Right, that is that is one of the drivers. Um, but make no, mis- no mistake, it is not it is not solely a Gen Z phenomenon. It's quite broad based in in what's driving this. So that's on the consumer side. Are companies doing things more right? Maybe <laughs> I mean, you know, there was a time when you thought of a green product and you thought of it as a less effective product. You know, it's interesting. We have when we've looked across the different categories and the the participation rates across categories, um, we don't always see that every major manufacturer is necessarily leading, right? Uh, and, and sometimes that they're not participating in a meaningful way. And what it means is that they're effectively leaving um, opportunity to drive uh, ESG led impact on the table. Um, and, and other times we do see that some of the leading companies are participating in a big way and, and, you know, they may have some mixed successes at times with that. Not all of the products that they put uh, claims against are necessarily outpacing growth, but on average they are right. So it, it takes a certain, um, uh, amount of, of, uh, investment in risk to, to benefit, right. Just like any other commercial decision. Monica, it's a really, I think your your question of our companies doing things more right is a really important question, right? Because the premise of all of this isn't you put a claim on the product for the sake of putting a claim on the product, right? The premise is you have to be doing things more right. You have to be investing in uh, you know, uh, sustainable products or, or organic products or fair trade labor, the, the list goes on. Um, but our, our belief is it's, it's companies, the fact that they're actually doing things that are being impactful in the ESG realm, and those are then showing up on products, right? It's not simply a marketing uh, vehicle. And I don't think I've yet had a conversation with a marketing leader, right? It's not about marketing. We've had conversations with R&D leaders and sustainability leaders and overall corporate leaders, right? Um, and so the notion is companies are doing things more right, and that is showing up in, in, in product. The fact that in the research, we found that there's loyalty, you know, there's a higher consumer loyalty to the brands, you know, that have more ESG claims. I think that that, um, as we've been taking the, that on and sharing with clients, you know, it's been really resonating where they've said, actually, we're, yeah, that's a, that's a different way that we want to be measuring ourselves as well in terms of how are we best serving our consumers. And, you know, to the point we were talking about earlier, if it also can make my business more resilient, 
you know, to things like inflation and I'm, you know, it, it meets the needs of my loyal consumers. Um, you know, maybe it's a different way of thinking it from a, from thinking about it from a price premium. That's definitely been uh, a big reaction we've had from clients. You know, you've talked about ways that companies are getting this right. What are some ways that companies are still getting this wrong? Like what are some sort of, I don't know, low hanging fruit or things that they should be steps that they should be taking immediately now that, uh, that this data is out there? This research was done based on claims on PAC. And, you know, we didn't validate anything or confirm, you know, or credibility, you know, we just, we took the at face value. Um, but I think what we're, we also find is there are a lot that companies are doing that they're actually not claiming on package. And, but we know from a consumer perspective, that's one of the top places that they're saying, I want it, I want it in on the package. You know, I, this is where I learn about a brand. I don't go to a company's website. I don't go look at their ESG report. You know, I really want it to be easy or I want it in digital discovery in terms of when I'm searching on a retailer websites. And I think that the fact that is, you know, there's still a lot of brands who are doing really great things that aren't actually communicating it to consumers on pack. And we know that, you know, packages, the, the real estate is, is very uh, limited. And so it's important, but uh, we think, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for more brands to be looking at what they're communicating to consumers on that uh, point of sale on the, the purchase there. One of the, the outstanding questions that we'd like to look into is whether the claim has a greater impact when it's shown uh, on the front panel, as opposed to being a smaller logo on the backside. Monica, to your question on what are companies missing, potentially, one is that you know, some companies appear to be taking a wait and see attitude towards, well, let somebody else try it first um, and and we'll follow. And we see cases where the, the first movers tend to see a greater advantage and a sustained advantage. So being an early mover has its advantages. The thing I've seen in terms of where some companies are, are perhaps missing the mark um, you, we look at prevalence of of claim, right? So how often is a claim showing up on your on your product? Um, and, and it varies quite a lot by category, as you would have seen in the research. But when you click below that, you'll see even within that average, companies are taking a very a very different approach, right? And our belief is this isn't about a silver bullet. Pick one product in one category and 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 go big on it, right? It's about a portfolio play that says, if you believe in this, you've got to do it across enough of your, your product portfolio that it, that it shows up and resonates at that level with, with consumers. Doesn't mean every one of those products is going to drive incremental growth, but we believe on average they will. And we see co some companies yet that have, you know, sub one or 2% prevalence of, of, of sustainability being built into their products. And so I do think doesn't mean it needs to be 50%, but I do think there's an opportunity to be a bit more bold with some of this research uh, at your back to invest across the portfolio. One of the other things in the research where we found that companies that were playing across more than one pillar, so they had claims in animal welfare and environmental and packaging, you know, that they would see two times the growth. I think that's, you know, probably, probably Monica, another area of opportunity where um, it is this kind of signaling, I think, to the consumer that we really are, you know, we're, we're in, we're authentically in this space. Um, so Steve, to your point, absolutely, you know, playing across more brands in the portfolio, but then also really thinking, how do we maybe not just play deeply in environmental, but communicate with them again across the, we looked at six pillars in the research, but across multiple pillars, um, I think is a, another area of, of great opportunity for brands. In an environment with lots of uncertainty economically, uh, you know, sort of threat uh, and talk of, of recession coming up, do companies sort of retrench a little bit and say, you know, as much as we'd like to invest in this, we just can't do it right now. So there's a little bit of concern there. My My point of view, at least, would be when you look at, at past uh, recessionary times, the companies that stuck to and invested behind the things that they knew were important to their business, driving customer experience, driving growth for retail, investing in front lines, the companies that stuck to it and did those things came out much better and enjoyed not just better performance in the in the year or two after that period, but in the 10 years after, right? And so I feel like this is a time where doing this well now sets you up for the next decade uh, of success. Um, and, and if you fall into the trap of saying, you know what, we can't really afford to do this right now, I think the opposite could be true, right? That you fall behind for the next decade. And so uh, there's a bit of a concern that, uh, of how much do companies lean into this, but I'm certainly hopeful. And I think this evidence points to the fact that leaning into this is a great long-term bet uh, for, for success. 
So what does this all take? Because, you know, are they hiring? Does that mean hiring new kinds of people? Does that mean, you know, doubling the size of your R&D organization? Does it mean reallocating resources? What are sort of the on the ground things that need to happen in order for companies to actually act on some of the findings in your report? I think maybe first and foremost is um, connecting the dots across the organization. So I, yeah, I, I still see a number of, some companies do a great job of this, right? But some you will have, you know, the, the folks that are focused on sustainability, a little bit off to the side, right? Not really connected into the core business, right? They may be offering a point of view when given the opportunity, but they're not, they're not at the table when making big decisions about R&D investment and product development and assortment decisions. And so I think that's maybe the first step. It's less about hiring a bunch of people and function X, Y, or Z. And it's more making sure you've got the right voices and the right facts, right? As, as this research would, would underscore at the, at the table. I think Steve, what, you know, um, and I don't know what's right or wrong here, but I would agree. It's been fascinating as we've taken this research out to clients, you know, and talked to different sustainability officers and asked, where do you sit? Where do you sit within the organization? And we're finding everything. You know, we're finding where sustainability sits under innovation. We're finding where sustainability, you know, directs, reports directly into the C-suite. And I don't know, you know, what's the, the right or the wrong, but I do think you're absolutely right about um, the integration of it. What we've seen in a best in class kind of approach is to say that, hey, you know, let's bring a cross-functional team of product designers, marketing people, sustainability experts together and say that what are the possibilities, right? And test it with consumers in a light way, right? It doesn't have to be a nine month project, right? It could be something uh, uh, somewhat simpler to say that let's let's put, pull together what's possible on the packaging and the product and the claims certification and, and even test it with consumers and try to bring it to market more quickly. So what's, what's next? What can uh, people look forward to on the consumer sustainability front? Well, one of the big questions that we're face, uh, asked about is uh, price premiums, and you know we're we're drilling into that over time. Um, another has to do with how have things changed since June of 2022. There's been a lot of inflation. There's been fears of a recession. Companies cutting back. You know, layoffs in the market. Right? How is that affecting consumer behavior? Right? And so far, you know, as Steve alluded to earlier, uh, we see some resilience. Um, but will that hold up? A little bit of the new news that's come out since the since the report. Um, so we've dug into price premium, and we found across the six broad buckets of sustainability uh, claims, all of them had a price premium. Those ranged from sixteen percent to thirty five percent. But like most things in this research, it varied a lot by category. So when you look at categories like beverages. Uh, or center store grocery, right? The the premiums tended to be zero to twenty percent. Um, when you looked at fresh meat and dairy, uh, personal care, right? Those tended to be you know 10, 20, 30, in some cases 40 plus percent. So the price piece uh, is is an interesting complement to what we already shared, and I think further reason to believe that that there's opportunity to 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 consider and invest in these attributes more broadly. I think the other piece, you know, there's there's questions that have come up, you know, um, specifically a lot of those medium sized brands are wondering, like, well, what do we do? Right. Where where's our opportunity or how do we play? And I think there's more research to be done. You know, there's some hypotheses around why they don't they don't receive the outsized growth that everyone else else does. I think the other piece is the consumer. You know, we that this consumer is so rapidly evolving. We've got some segmentations of consumers, and it's again everybody from that's super passionate and really tying their health, their personal health, and the environment together, to the, the that small segment of people that are apathetic. How does this, you know, really play across the claims and the categories? There's kind of that deeper level of dissection we think that needs to happen. I think I also see an opportunity that. As governments start to mandate things like what we're seeing in Europe, um, the, the importance of this is going to become more and more urgent that companies need to have answers, right, for their own stakeholders, for their own employees and customers as to what they're doing, how they're going to meet their own commitments, and being able to uh, point to factual evidence beyond consumer sentiment says so um, will, will be important. Maybe the closing thought for me, for, for listeners, would be um, – Continue to talk about it, and share it. If you're a CPG player, talking to the, the folks that are further back your supply chain, actually producing the product, talking to retailers uh, that, that are selling those products, right? And, and engaging in discussion about you know, what this means and how collectively we, we continue to advance 
um, the good we're doing in, in sustainability and ESG, and then have products as one way that, that that shows up, I think would be my my maybe parting thought is it's not a uh, in a cone of, of silence, right? It ought to be something that we're collaborating on and, and, and sharing broadly. And so I would encourage folks to do that. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the McKinsey on Consumer and Retail podcast. A transcript of this conversation will be posted on McKinsey.com very soon. To suggest topics for future episodes, email us at consumer underscore podcast at McKinsey.com. To stay connected with us, subscribe to our email alerts on McKinsey.com. Thanks again for listening.